Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at how we can use SUVA equations on two dimensional type problems. So we're going to look at two scenarios today. We're going to look at slopes and we're going to look at projectile motion. Now, in terms of the skills we're going to look at, um, I'm anticipating before this video that you spent some time looking at resolving and combining vectors, um, but I'm going to give a brief overview of how that applies to these two scenarios. And then we're going to actually have a look at how we can apply SUVA equations to two perpendicular dimensions in projectile motion and finish off looking at how we combine vectors together to get the resultant magnitude and direction. So that's what we're going to take a look at. Let's move on to slopes to start with. So one situation in which we need to be able to resolve vectors is when we're dealing with slopes. So if we're just considering it with the weight force of the object acting on it. So we know weight forces always act from the center of an object and they always act vertically downwards. But we know that the object is going to slide down the slope and it's going to slide parallel to the surface of the slope. So what we need to do is figure out the component of the weight force that's parallel to the slope, which we can see down here, uh, which I've labeled as W sine theta. So we've got that using some trigonometry. So what I've done is I've taken the weight force here and I've split it up into a right angle triangle with the sides here and here. And the first thing you have to do is figure out what the angle is at the top of your triangle. So if we look at the right angle triangle on the left, if this angle here is theta, we know this is 90. So this must be 90 minus theta. If this component is perpendicular to the slope, we know this angle in here is going to be theta as well. And using trigonometry, uh, if the hypotenuse is W and the angle is theta, the side opposite to the angle is going to be W sine theta. And once we know the force parallel to the slope, we can work out what the acceleration is parallel to the slope as well. So that's one scenario in which we're going to end up resolving vectors. The next is when we're given properties at different angles. So if we have a look at this, when we start to look at projectile motion, what we're going to do is we're going to split things up into their vertical and horizontal components. So we've got velocity here shown by the red arrow and it's at a certain angle to the horizontal so what we do is we split it up into two components one that's vertical and one that's horizontal so we've got the vertical component of velocity is v sine theta and the horizontal is v cosine theta because then what we can do is we can apply suva in the vertical direction and we can apply it in the horizontal direction as well so this is often the first stage of dealing with projectile motion type problems Okay, so when we're dealing with projectile motion, we, when we're doing calculations with it, we'll be modeling it as the only force acting on it is the weight force of the object, which we know acts vertically. So if an object is only acted on via vertical force, that means the acceleration must only be in the vertical direction, or another way of saying that is the acceleration in the horizontal direction is zero if the acceleration is only vertical. So the way we can express that is in two different forms. So we might express the acceleration in this kind of form. So uh, the top part of this vector tells you the acceleration in the x direction. The bottom tells you the acceleration in the y direction. Sometimes you might see that using i, j, k notation, where i is in the x direction and j is in the y direction, but we don't come across that too much in A-level physics. Um, typically what we do is we express acceleration with magnitude and an angle, but I just want to show you what it might look like in other forms. So this is the basic principle of it, so let's have a look at the SUVA equations in two dimensions. So when we were doing one dimensional SUVAP, we've got this equation, V equals U plus AT. Now in two dimensions, what we do is we express that in using this vector notation. So 
The time is going to be the same in both the x and the y directions. There's no components of time. It's going to apply in both directions. So that's why we don't have that in vector notation. But every other property, the initial velocity, the, velocity, the final velocity and the acceleration are vector quantities. So we can express them with horizontal and vertical components. So this would be the corresponding equation in two dimensions there. And we, I use V with a subscript H to denote the final velocity in the horizontal direction. I use a little V to denote it in the vertical direction. So it's not too much different. We've just got a little bit more complicated. If we look through the next few equations, again, we should recognize this equation right here. Um, again, time is a scalar quantity, so we don't have vector notation. Likewise, for the half, it's just a multiplier, so it doesn't really have a vector either. But you can see here, we've just turned the displacement, the initial velocity, and the acceleration into vectors with components in the horizontal and vertical directions. Same thing with this equation here. All we've done is turn this into a vector component like this and then finally with this equation again we've just turned all the vectors that are in the equation which in this case is everything except the two into horizontal and vertical components there uh, nothing too complicated this is how we express motion in two dimensions if we were doing three-dimensional motion all we would do is we'd have three terms and we'd have vz which would be your third um, direction as well but we won't come across any of those at a level it will be beyond where you start looking at three-dimensional motion okay so those are our general equations let's see what we might use those for so as i said at the start when we're doing projectile motion we consider that the object is only accelerating in the vertical direction due to gravity so what we can do is we can simplify these equations slightly so what we can see here is in the horizontal direction you'll see that any time there was an acceleration it's been made equal to zero so some terms have disappeared so where there was a 2as to start with for this equation there isn't any more because a is zero um, same with over here the half at squared becomes zero and the at becomes zero down the bottom right as well so these are the same equations but we're just using horizontal acceleration is zero to simplify our equations and these will be the vector equations we use to solve projectile motion problems okay so uh, one useful thing to figure out from these equations is that the time a projectile is in the air only depends on the vertical component of the velocity of the object. Um, so that is quite a useful thing to know. So if we look at this equation on the bottom right, we can see that the initial velocity in the horizontal direction is just equal to the final velocity in the horizontal direction which is a useful thing to know that it stays the same the whole time and we can see that using the bottom equation there the time in the air is dependent on the initial velocity in the vertical direction the acceleration in the vertical direction and the final velocity in the vertical direction it has nothing to do with horizontal components of velocity or acceleration uh, which is quite an interesting property and is quite useful to us and we can see from this equation on the top left again this equation predicts that the vertical and horizontal sorry the horizontal components of initial and final velocity are the same as each other so that is a thing that you'll find in all projectile motion problems in the horizontal direction the velocity stays the same the whole time and likewise like with flight time if we want to know the maximum height to which an object is going to reach this again is not dependent on the horizontal properties of motion at all um, so we can see that if we want to find the maximum height um, maximum height is when the vertical component of velocity is zero so we can see that's been put in down here at the bottom left and we can see that once we do that we can work out that the maximum height is given when we have this expression here so it it's nothing to do with the horizontal components of motion, which is interesting.
And then if we want to calculate the time which an object is in flight, this again doesn't depend on the um, the horizontal components of velocity whatsoever. So we can see that if we want to find the horizontal distance traveled by an object, all we need to know is the initial velocity in the horizontal direction and the flight time. So flight time gives us a way of finding what we call the range of an object. But if we actually want to find how long something's going to be in the air, we need to put in to start with what the initial height of the object is. So the reason we've put minus h in down here in the bottom left is during its flight, it's going to be displaced from its starting height h down to ground level at zero. So its displacement is going to be minus h during the flight. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put in our initial uh, velocity in the vertical direction and our acceleration in the vertical direction as well. And we get left with an expression up here, like we can see on the right hand side, and we'd be able to solve this using um, using essentially the quadratic formula would be one method of solving this. Or an, another way you might see is when the initial velocity in the horizontal direction is zero, this is much simpler to solve and you don't need the quadratic formula. But this is as complicated as it gets with a projectile motion. You may need to use your quadratic formula to solve the question there. But hopefully you should be familiar with doing that. So that's the different scenarios you see. So typically with projectile motion, the things you have to work out would be the maximum height of the object, the flight time of the object, and then the maximum range of the object using the flight time afterwards and the horizontal component of velocity. So once we've done that, the last thing we might want to calculate is what speed an object hits the ground at, for instance. So what we would do is, I'm going to give an example here. So let's say an object is fired from 10 meters up in the air and it's traveling initially traveling horizontally at 20 meters per second. So let's um, pick our equation. So if we don't know how long it's going to be in the air, this would be the equation we would use. And what we're going to do is we can see I've substituted the numbers. So our initial velocity in the horizontal direction we know is 20. Our initial velocity in the vertical direction is zero if it's traveling horizontally. And our acceleration in the vertical direction is minus 9.81 because it's downwards and it's going to be displaced by 10 meters downwards when it hits the ground. So doing that, we can solve what the horizontal and the vertical components of velocity are. And if you want to know how I've decided to use the negative square root, you have to think about the fact that it's going to be heading downwards by the time it hits the ground. So we know it's the vertical component is going to be the negative square root. If we want to get the magnitude of the velocity, we've got two components which are perpendicular to each other. So we can use Pythagoras to figure out what the overall magnitude is. And we'll express it to two significant figures because our data is to two significant figures. So that's how we'd work out the speed at which the object hits the ground. But what about figuring out theta? So to work out the angle at which the velocity is to the horizontal in this case, we've got three sides of the triangle, so we could use any trigonometric function. I went for tan. So tan of the angle is going to be the opposite divided by the adjacent. So that's minus 14 divided by 20. And that gives us a value of theta of minus 35 degrees, which means it's 35 degrees below the horizontal. And if you think about this in terms of projectile motion, it shouldn't be too surprising that it is downward. The general motion is going of an object that's fired is going to sort of be like this. So we can see that it would end up going down downwards there. So that's not too surprising. OK, so those are the key things to do with two dimensional SUVAT that we'll use. And so hopefully at this point you are familiar with how we can resolve a vector into two components using trigonometry. And you are familiar with how we apply SUVAT equations in two perpendicular dimensions for projectile motion using acceleration is zero in the horizontal direction. And then the final thing we've looked at how once we've got 
perpendicular components, how we can combine those together to get the resultant magnitude and direction. So that completes this video looking at 2D SUVAT. I hope you found that useful. Please feel free to comment and let me know if there's anything that you're not sure about or you want to ask any questions. Um, this, these methods might have looked a little bit different to what you see in your textbooks. They're quite similar to what you see in the mechanics part of A-level maths. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to watch and I hope you'll watch some videos in the future.